Welcome everyone. It is now five o'clock and time to begin. I'm Donald Taylor and I'm responsible for membership and chapter liaisons at TASH. Welcome to, the, to today's training, Building the Case for Action, presented by Lisa Mills and Barb Trader. This is the first part of our four-part webinar series, Chapter Skills Development, Making Change Happen in Your State. A number of important federal laws and regulations to improve the lives of people with disabilities have recently come into effect, but require quality implementation at the state and local levels for their impact to be realized. This series is designed to help develop among chapters and members the full range of skills necessary for making these state and local policy changes. The format of today's series is that our presenters will speak for about 50 minutes and then there will be 10 minutes at the end dedicated to participant questions and answers. But just because there is dedicated time at the end doesn't mean that you have to hold your questions until then. Our presenters will address questions as they come in, so don't hesitate to pose a question as you think of it. Participant microphones are enabled, so if you have a microphone on your computer, you can pose your question via the webinar audio. The microphone defaults to muted. To activate your microphone, to pose a question, notice the microphone icon at the center top menu bar. Click it one, clicking, clicking it once will activate your microphone. When your microphone is active, the icon will turn green. We request that you keep your microphone muted when not actively participating so as to minimize audio interruptions. If you do not have audio on your computer, you can use the chat box in the lower right corner to type your questions and our presenters will read them out for the rest of the participants. Also notice the green speaker icon at the top center to the left of the microphone icon. You can use this drop down volume control to adjust your individual volume. Today we're excited to have Lisa Mills and Barb Trader to explain the status of the implementation of key laws and why the present moment is so important for members to be taking action. Lisa Mills is a consultant on the disability employment policy and systems chain on, dis on Lisa Mills is a consultant on disability employment policy and systems change working in 14 states under various contracts with state government agencies and federally funded initiatives. She has 25 years of experience in the field of disability with a primary focus on people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Lisa is the co-chair of the Employment Committee for TASH. Barb Trader is the executive director here at TASH. In her role at TASH, Barb leads Appraise, the Alliance for Prevention of Restraint, Aversive Intervention, and Seclusion, a 23-member alliance of national nonprofits with a mission to eliminate aversive interventions. She also serves as the co-chair of the Education Work Group for the Collaboration, for the collaboration to Promote Self-Determination, a 15-member coalition to advance high-impact public policy. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Mills and Barb Trader. Great. Well, thank you, Donald, for that. And thanks, everybody, for being a part of today's webinar. Um, you can't hear me? <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. Um, the, I'd just like to Not explain a bit about why this. Oh, Donald, can you hear me? Um, I wanted to explain a bit about why we put this webinar series together and um, give you a bit of a background as we go through the slides. Primarily, we've had a lot of requests for cha from chapters throughout the years to help them construct a methodology for approaching change in their states. And as Lisa and I go through these slides, we'll get, we're sort of building the case for why change at the states is so critically important, especially right now. So that's, um, we hope at the end you'll be very excited to get started because we think the time is really ripe. Um, Donald, do I have capacity for advancing the slides? Oh, there we go. Yes, there's in the corner. Thanks. So for today's agenda, the first thing that we will cover is 
the fact that um, we really are pretty new into the disability rights movement. For those of us who are impatient people by nature or who have been in the field for a long time, we don't think that we've made a great deal of progress. But when you think about the nature of change in a society, we have made a lot of progress since this movement just got started about 40 years ago. So the culture within which we live still informs a lot of what gets decided. And that's why it's important for us to be active. We also want to cover the federal framework for inclusive communities, which is rather robust. And we'll go over that. We'll look at the data that exists and where you can find that data so you can understand where the gaps are in your state. Um, we'll look a little at the nature of state and local action. And finally, we'll just talk a little bit about the power that you really have at your fingertips when you're involved with TASH members at the local level. So to get started, um, this series will feature quotes of the day um, for each of the series. And today's quote is by Dor Dorothy Day, which, who is one of our great social change champions. And her quote is, our problems stem from our acceptance of this filthy, rotten system. And that's such an apt quote for a lot of reasons. But I think... Um, for me, it signifies the fact that if we are pretty discontented with the way things are for the people who we are committed to serving, then you have the makings of an advocate. And that discontent is what drives our desire to make change. So to prepare to make change, you always start with what your vision is and what you really want to see for people. And for these 40 years that TASH has been around, our vision has been pretty much the same. And that vision is a world in which people with disabilities are fully participating members of their communities. And where communities welcome everyone, where you don't have to earn your way in, where no one is segregated and everyone belongs. Well, that's our vision. And if we look around, we can see that we're not really there yet. So there are big gaps between our vision and what the reality is. <clears throat> so as I said at the beginning, we come from a history of oppression. <clears throat> people with disabilities, like a lot of other marginalized people, come from a culture or um, come from a history of where they were actively not wanted. And um, I don't know if you all have come across what's known as the ugly laws. But these are a series of laws. Many, most of the states in the United States actually had laws on the books that justified and actually called for the segregation of people away from the rest of society. And I've given you, <coughs> excuse me, a reference for where you can find a short one, one pager on this. So. Um, to really emphasize this, I'll read some of these excerpts. The Alabama legislature declared them a menace to the happiness of the community. A Texas law mandated segregation to relieve society of the heavy economic and moral losses arising from the existence at large of these unfortunate persons. In Pennsylvania, disabled people officially were termed antisocial beings. In Washington, unfitted for companionship with other children. In Vermont, a blight of mankind. In Wisconsin, my home state, a danger to the race. And in Kansas, a misfortune both to themselves and to the public. And these were actual excerpts of state laws that existed during the last century many of which were not removed from state law until the 60s or the 70s. So if you put that into context, there is a history of oppression. Um, and that kind of um, state-mandated um, separation and segregation is what allowed 
society to dehumanize people to the extent that we buried people in state institutions with just numbers on their graves. Um, this is an actual grave marker in the state of Wisconsin. So that's the bad news. We come from this history of oppression, but we've made so much progress in the last 40 years since TASH has been around. I did want to mention two things that are outside of our history. One is Brown versus Board of Education. This is actually what a Supreme Court decision that most of us know about, which first stated that separate is not equal. And that's in, that was for children of color, but it also has a lot of ramifications for children uh, that are disenfranchised for any reason. Then Section 504 of the Rehab Act was the first act that said that physical and program programmatic accessibility is expected if you're using federal funds. We know that IDEA was passed in 1975 and it calls for access, equal access to public education a free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. Those are powerful words. Um, and then the Katie Beckett waiver was um, provided in 1982, and this was really a landmark decision to make Medicaid money available to support children living at home instead of having to go to an institution to receive uh, public support for their care. So, Lisa, do you want to talk about the last two on this list? Sure. Um, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, we are uh, celebrating 25 years this year, the passage of this landmark civil rights law for people with disabilities. But I think it's fair to say that we're still struggling with uh, meeting the spirit of the law in every state, especially the integration mandate, the requirement that people must be receive services in the most integrated settings, which of course is in the community alongside of the rest of us. But at the same time, while we may be disappointed in, in how far we've come in the last 25 years, the ADA is still a very powerful tool for change, and it still very much strongly supports all the values of TASH. Um, and we continue to see actions by the Department of Justice in states that uh, are not living up to the spirit of the ADA. Uh, the next item, the Workforce Investment Act, uh, it's actually been uh, reauthorized uh, this past year. It was passed in 1997, um, authorizing the workforce systems across the country uh, and funding those systems and a very strong emphasis on a presumption of employability appeared in that law. Uh, and you see, even, you see today new moves by the federal government to uh, refuse to accept uh, any decisions not to provide people with employment services on the basis of someone's presumption that they aren't employable. So we know that, that while this law has been on the books since 1997, that we are in a time now where it is increasingly completely unacceptable to refuse to serve somebody in employment services on the basis that some we think that they uh, aren't employable. So then in um, 1999, the Olmstead decision, which was um, uh, made by the Supreme Court, um, which was the result of a federal lawsuit um, based on Title II of the ADA. So the Olmstead decision really underscored and enforced the community integration mandate of Title II of the ADA. Um, in 2000, in the year 2000, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was, it was the first public education bill that um, stated that all children can learn. And in that um, strong statement by Congress, they also held for the first time all states accountable for the education of all children through a, an accountability system. Uh, we believe that this was a really important civil rights um, statement by Congress in the general education law. 
then um, Lisa will share with you the HCBS waiver. Uh, so it, last year, um, the federal uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services issued new regulations uh, governing uh, home and community-based services. Uh, the waivers are the programs you probably know that states operate to give people an option other than an institution in me uh, Medicaid. And um, after five years of developing these regulations, they were released last year. Um, and they say essentially that um, if, if states want to use this funding stream to provide services to people with disabilities and elderly people, that they must provide those services in integrated community settings. And they establish a set of standards for those, serv for those settings in the regulations. Um, settings that isolate people from the broader community, that don't give them access to the community, that don't help working age people pursue employment in the community. Um, all of those settings um, will have to change their practices or uh, no longer use this funding and uh, be phased out. So um, the states are now in the process of developing uh, assessments to determine how to what extent they're in compliance with this rule and what uh, service settings they may have that don't meet the standards and that, um, that they must make changes to in the next five years. They have until March of 2019 to bring all the settings into compliance with this new rule. Um, uh, WIOA uh, is the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. Um, this is the reauthorization of the Workforce Investment Act that I talked about on the previous slide. Uh, so it was uh, long overdue. Um, it was passed in 2014 and signed into law in that year. Um, it includes, so this reauthorizes the workforce investment system and it also reauthorizes all state VR agencies. So this is the new federal law for both of those systems. Um, there is a tremendous emphasis on youth with disabilities transitioning to integrated employment. Um, and the VR agencies in every state now have obligations to uh, provide uh, counseling to youth uh, uh, to ensure that they are on a path to integrated employment. And there are restrictions for the first time on the use of subminimum wage and aimed at youth and ensuring that youth cannot simply go into a sheltered workshop or into any other kind of subminimum wage employment without having first um, fully explored integrated employment and receive services through vocational rehabilitation. So this is a, a huge um, move forward in terms of trying to ensure that youth with disabilities leave school with jobs or post-secondary education. Barb, do you want to handle the last one? Sure. Um... In, I believe it was the end of 2000, oh, I can't remember the year. It was in 2014. Um, if you remember right, the president said in his inaugural address, or in the State of the Union address at the beginning of 2014 that he was going to raise the minimum wage. Well, that gave an opportunity for disability advocates to ask him to, um, make sure that all federal contractors, because he cited federal contractors, that those contractors that employ people with disabilities in enclaves and in sheltered workshops also make the same minimum wage as their non-disabled counterparts. And through um, some advocacy and some um, real effort within the Department of Labor, the president ended up including um, federal contractors that hire people with disabilities and even if they made less than a minimum wage before the executive order went into um, effect, they now make $10.15. So this is the first time that the President of the United States has ever said officially and publicly that it's unacceptable to pay people with disabilities less than minimum wage. It, so that, in and of itself, that message is a very, very strong victory. 
So we have this slide covers a few things that are still in action and um, as well as some things that have um, um, been concluded. These are not um, necessarily all pieces of legislation. Um, the Keeping All Students Safe Act, most of you have heard of um, over and over again. This act was first introduced and passed the House in 2009. TASH has been very much the driver of this legislation. It's been reintroduced in every Congress since. It has yet to pass. There's strong opposition from some school groups to its passage. But what it stimulated is a lot of state laws passing. So, but the federal law is, has been reintroduced again, and that in and of itself just puts pressure on states to take action. The Time Act was introduced in the last Congress and has been reintroduced in this Congress. This calls for the end of the payment of the end of the san federal sanctioning of sub-minimum wage payments to people with disabilities, and that time frame would be t three years. So that. If that law passes, that would make a huge difference um, in services. And um, Lisa? Yeah, with regard to the Olmstead decision on uh, the integration mandate of the ADA, we have seen um, this administration, the U.S. Department of Justice, really taking that to heart and um, for the first time in 2011 clarifying that the integration mandate applies to all publicly funded services. It does not just apply to where people live. And um, they made it clear that if people are being segregated in employment and day services, that that is also a violation of the ADA if a state unnecessarily segregates people and relies on those types of models. Um, they. Uh, published that opinion in 2011, and soon after that, they went after two states for having too many people with developmental disabilities in sheltered workshops and segregated day programs, two states that arguably are thought of as uh, very highly in terms of their services for people with disabilities, no waiting lists, no institutions, uh, but they had a problem with too many people left to languish in day programs and sheltered workshops. And so we've seen the U.S. Department of Justice come out very strong. Um, and that, that has helped a, uh, the development and growth of employment first across the country. I think there are now 46 states that um, have active employment first initiatives. And that has, the concept has been around for a while, but it is gaining tremendous momentum. Uh, and the principle is that public funding should be focused on integrated employment as a priority outcome for people with disabilities. It's not, um, not limited to one disability group. Um, it's uh, across the board um, trying to raise the expectation that people should have the right to good supports to work and be expected to work. So if if you think about the last four slides and everything that Lisa and I have talked about, um, you you know an outside person who's new to the disability world would think, well, what's the matter? You have such a strong set of civil rights protections at the federal level. Well, what the matter is, is how states implement what's in federal law. So, Lisa. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to make sure we didn't accidentally advance sure. too far. This is the correct slide. Um, so what we have is clear federal uh, expectations that are very consistent with TASH's values. But what ends up happening in the United States is that states have a fair amount of leeway on how they interpret and implement the federal requirements. Um, and this is why advocacy at the state level is so important, because we see great variations in what states are doing, what they think their obligations are, um, where they put their money. And um, you would think you wouldn't have that kind of variation under a, a, a solid, consistent federal umbrella, but we do. Um, and so a lot of the spirit and intent of the federal laws and regulations 
only happen in states if state state level advocacy is done. Um, so states uh, they are able to interpret what uh, what is expected. They have a lot of flexibility on how they implement community services. Um, they are expected to involve stakeholders, but um, not all of them do a good job with that. Not all of them really want to hear what stakeholders have to say. So you have to be tough advocates if, if you have a state that's not listening. Um, states also uh, are responsible for enforcement and ensuring that uh, the federal laws are followed. Um, and states, to varying degrees, don't always do a good job with that. Um, there is state level data that can be used and I find that very helpful to compare data between states um, to really uh, highlight uh, where a state needs to improve. Uh, but there are also a set that we are clearer and clearer every day on what counts as evidence based and promising practices. TASH is at the forefront with identifying those uh, and developing those and uh, but some states are still investing really heavily in practices that we know do not produce good outcomes. Uh, this slide is really powerful. In fact, if you print any slide out of this uh, deck, I would print this and carry it around with you. Um, this is a, a one page that captures all of the failings of uh, the system that we have right now. Uh, up in the right hand corner you can see that the federal government spends nearly 400 billion dollars actually I'm sure it's over that by now annually to support people with disabilities in our country but 95 percent of that money goes toward uh, income maintenance SSI and Medicaid and all of that are those are programs that are premised on the idea that people don't work and don't have a job so they don't have income they don't have access to employer health care uh, and so we set up these programs that presume and to some extent make people feel like they can't pursue employment um, so we only spend one percent of that astronomical figure on investment in employment and education and training and that really speaks volumes to why so many people continue to live in poverty and are isolated from from the rest of their communities um, we know support employment is a good investment we have increasing research that says support employment is a good investment for everybody involved for taxpayers for supported employees and for business yet we see so little investment in that service model um, at this point, we know unemployment is uh, around 70% nationally. Um, that, uh, despite that, uh, we see you know 86% of youth with intellectual developmental disabilities leave school expecting to have a job. They do not want to be unemployed. But we have a system of supports that tracks them into sheltered work and day programs. At sometimes as the only option um, and this this is what a broken system does it's very expensive and it produces really poor outcomes for people so there's a whole series of uh, I won't go over every statistics that's on this slide but when you take it together um, we really need a major systems change is this the quote again I like this quote <laughs> I think I might get a uh, bumper sticker made with that on. <laughs> Turn it over. So um, we've laid out for you that sort of the history of oppression, the federal response because of advocacy to that history of oppression, the federal floor of civil rights protections that are available for people, and the levers that we have as advocates for use in states. Um, we've also shared with you um, what the current situation is from a federal investment standpoint and the lousy outcomes we're getting. So the action, all the action, is really at the state level. You guys, there's nowhere we can go but up. <laughs> 
you guys have an awful lot of opportunity to make a difference in the lives of people in every state. We have some states that are real high performers now for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, but there's room for improvement in every state. So here is, the, uh, is a list of potential data sources that you as advocates could consider to see what's happening in your state compared to what you would like to see happen in your state. Um, I don't have a data source for accountability. Um, that would probably be available through your Department of Ed website. But for everything else, um, I was able to share a data source. And I'm sure if we worked hard enough, we could find a federal source for accountability. One thing that Lisa said just a minute ago is she likes to compare state data. One lever, lever for states is just letting them know that they're performing so badly compared to other states. No state wants their stakeholders to know that and to hold them accountable for that. So that's one way you can use data. Another way you can use data is just to um, underscore the cost, the poor use of public funds. The previous slide showed you the sort of the federal picture of that, but you can take some of those data points and extrapolate to your state, or you can find data sources in your own state. But we're getting lousy, lousy outcomes for a whole, an enormous federal investment, both at the K through 12 level and in adult services. So here are some data sources. Um, we know that um, there's rampant segregation of students that we care about at the K through 12 level. Um, right now, nationally, it's at about 95% um, are segregated. This is clearly unacceptable based on um, how long IDEA has been in force. Uh, we know that discipline is disproportionately used against students with disabilities. 75% um, of all students restrained are students with disabilities. Kids with disabilities are twice as likely to be expelled and suspended. Um, we also, oh, this is, Lisa, this is yours to cover. <laughs> so, yeah, in, in the adult publicly funded system with Medicaid, we know that um, 87% of funding that goes to daytime supports for people goes to facility-based sheltered work and facility-based day services, segregated settings um, where people with disabilities are congregated together. Uh, we know that only 13% of the funding actually goes to supports for integrated employment and other integrated supports where people um, get help to spend time in their communities. So you can see the kind of rebalancing that needs to happen in our system, even though we have the ADA and we have the new HCBS settings regulations and we have a lot of things federally that, are, that should be affecting this state's um, have not come up with serious plans to make these kinds of shifts. So um, I think, oh, there we go. I think Lisa and I both did, uh, advanced at the same time. So we've built the case for why advocacy is really important. And um, most people that I know that are in the business of making change happen came on to it very accidentally. Very few of us started our careers or our lives envisioning ourselves as advocates or as people who can make change happen on a broad scale. So this is a fairly accidental role that we fall into and I share that with you to be sort of an empowering notion because some, the best advocates I know the Mary Gonzalez's of the world, the Michael Remus's of the world, the Nancy Ward's of the world are people that never intended to be advocates. It was just because of life circumstance, because of the children that came into their lives or the lives that they were leading themselves. They decided that it was either going to be um, act on 
stuff or be completely discontented forever. And it certainly feels better to do something. So um, if you, I know that some people feel like they couldn't possibly be the ones to make change happen, but that's probably how most of us started. So um, you're in good company there. Um, and I also think that what really drives us is an ethic of equity. People belong to TASH because they believe in equity. And in order to make equity happen for the people in our lives, we really have to speak out. That's probably our best and only option. So um, I've listed some very um, famous um, cases that came in front of the Supreme Court that have changed our world. And these cases all were started by individuals. Um, Rachel Holland is a young girl from California. A lot of Caltash members were involved in this um, Supreme Court case. In fact, the woman who argued the case, the lead attorney who argued the case in front of the Supreme Court, was the mom of a child with a disability who was segregated from her public school, who got mad and went and got her law degree. And she's the person who successfully argued that case. So I think all of us who get into this are um, have the tools, have the ethics, have the values necessary to be great advocates. So I want to just share with you there's um, some just Im important structures to think about when you're thinking about local advocacy. One is there are three real distinct levels of advocacy. You can advocate for one person, so that's individual advocacy, and a lot of us have done that in our lives. But the thing that we have to realize is if we're advocating for one person at a time, we're impacting one person at a time. Um, so then a lot of people get motivated to take on systems advocacy so that that effort for one person is expanded to include everyone that that system might impact. So systems advocacy is really important. And then finally, people understand that in order to replicate systems advocacy and to sustain systems advocacy beyond a committed leader or a charismatic leader, we really need public advocacy so that we change laws, so that we change the culture so that we change the way people view people with disabilities. And each layer of advocacy is really important. Public advocacy is the advocacy that has the most lasting, most impactful result. Then there are three strategies of advocacy. And I would say that TASH has been very involved in all three strategies throughout our history. One is um, educating people, um, and there's a lot of ways that we conduct education. A second is to develop legislation and to advocate for the passage of legislation. And a third is litigation. Litigation is a really important advocacy tool. Here are some examples of things that we do to educate. Um, of course, we have our conference. One thing that I really would like to encourage chapters to think about is inviting elected officials to see what inclusion really looks like, to um, experience an inclusive school, to um, get to know you, to um, follow a person throughout their workday so they see something besides um, what the status quo is. Uh, forums and briefings are really effective. Uh, study tours um, where um, elected officials, state agency decision makers, and others go from um, place to place to see that um, inclusion works in a variety of different communities, not just one school. So those are some ideas for education strategies. In terms of legislate legislation, um, chapters have um, the chance to work with your state legislature. You also can work within your state agencies that are relevant to people with disabilities. 
TASH at the federal level does a lot of work. We may have more impact with our federal agencies. Um, this administration in particular has been very actively engaged with TASH on making change happen through the regulatory process. Um, states also have planning processes that they're required to engage in, and that's another um, avenue for chapters to get active and to advocate. Um, for example, um, the State Teacher Equity Plan is due to um, the Department of Education by June 15th. This plan would show that the state is going to have highly effective teachers involved with all communities and with all students. So that's just an example of something that's coming up that is a planning process that's a way that advocates can make a difference. And then another example is um, school boards. Um, I'm sure you know all these things. I just thought it would be useful to show examples of these three strategies. And then in terms of litigation, we're pretty familiar with, I think, the due process personal advocacy approach for students with disabilities. But one thing that Lisa talked about earlier, which is really an effective way to um, make sure enforcement of these federal laws happen is through class action lawsuits. Um, the two sheltered workshop cases that Lisa's been involved in are both class action lawsuits brought by disability rights attorneys, and um, as well as the residential institutionalization work that's been done in um, Virginia, Illinois, and Georgia. So um, we're waiting and hoping for a class action lawsuit on restraint and seclusion, and also for a class action lawsuit on systematic uh, segregation of students, perhaps by disability category. Those things would be extremely powerful, and it's really overdue for us to have suits like that. Then there's three legs of the advocacy stool, and this is um, three different ways you can impact both legislation and public opinion. And one is to inter interact with your state decision makers, both the elected officials, but also the appointed officials in state agencies. Getting to know those people, becoming a resource to those people, um, being valuable to them for what you, the expertise that you have. Um, and also pushing them to do the right thing. Then engaging your grassroots and making sure that your chapter, at minimum, is really engaged in the change you're trying to bring about and is writing letters and is going they're going to meetings and they're doing those things that you want them to do. But in the grassroots there's also partners that we want to think about that are interested in the same issues that you're working on. And those partners may be different issue to issue. And finally, and I think this is something the disability community has been a little too polite about. I don't know that we've done enough with the media. I think we can, the media is a powerful partner in making change happen and is particularly interested the more local you get. Um, all community papers cover what's going on with the school board. So um, I think there's a lot of change we can make with, new, with the media. <coughs> Each of the agencies that fund disability programs also has an Office of Civil Rights. This is the um, Department of Ed's Office of Civil Rights. You may have participated in the TASH Town Hall at the TASH Conference on Inclusive Education where Catherine Lehman, the Assistant Secretary of the Office of Civil Rights, sat there and said, they track every complaint every complaint that comes to the U.S. Department of Education is, is investigated. So this is a powerful way also to advocate. One of the dreams I've had over the last couple years is that a chapter would get so incensed with the level of segregation that's happening in your state that you would pepper the Department of Education's OCR with um, complaints about rampant segregation in your state. That is a strategy that is very, that could be very useful. Um, 
And the bottom line is that we have, within TASH, we have a tremendous amount of power. Um, more power than I think we realize. Um, TASH was one of the main instigators of so much of the change that we've seen happen at the federal level. What we need to do now is really turn our attention to the state level. We have um, networks of people who share our same vision. We have um, chapters who have maybe 30 members now, but the state has had 400 chap chapter uh, state members in the history of TASH, and we have those lists. So we know who, where to find people who are committed to our same vision. We have really compelling stories about the way the system is currently impacting people, both positive stories, but we also have very negative stories. Those stories matter to decision makers. We have parents and people with disabilities who can tell those stories in a really powerful way. We have a lot of data and we have experts within our network who know how to work that data. Um, we have knowledge of best practices. We have experts who are willing to speak um, about those best practices. We have expertise available to any decision maker on any topic related to this population of people. And we have networks and relationships with a broad swath of the disability community and other communities, such as anti the anti-poverty movement, who can be leveraged at the state level. So we really have everything we need. We have an enviable list of assets at our fingertips. So I, th I think it's time for us to really um, invite our chapters to create a change agenda and leverage what these assets are. So the question is, do we get started? And how do we get started? And I think the first thing is to believe that you can make a difference. And the second thing is to think about, you know, what would be possible if, to dream a little bit, what would be possible if we were to establish a change agenda? And why wouldn't we want to do that? So. Um, Believing and dreaming are some of the first steps that we need to take on. So the tip of the week is believe in your ability to make change. And if you want inspiration for that tip, just click on this link and it will lead you to the group of university students. These are undergra well, undergraduate and graduate students in social work who were the key drivers, there are five or six students, who were the key drivers to getting the state law passed in Virginia on restraint and seclusion prevention, one of the strongest state laws in the nation. So that's what Lisa and I are covering today. And we are right at uh, 5.48, right on time. Um, we'd love to answer your questions. So what are they? <laughs> Thank you, Lisa, in case I don't get a chance to say that to you later. <clears throat> Hello. Someone is typing. Okay. I would remind participants that your microphones are active. If you have a microphone on your computer, you can unmute it by clicking the microphone button at the top of your screen, and you can ask your question. If not, you can type your question in the box in the lower right corner. Victoria, I love what you just said. <laughs> but you can speak. We, we give you the, um, we hope that your energy will allow you to speak momentarily. So Jamie, uh, your question is, is Tash looking to build more chapters in more states? And the answer would be yes. Um, I believe that um, states where there are chapters are um, often in better shape and chapters are effective at influencing what goes on. And we really do hope that um, we increase our chapter network. So, Jamie, I'd be curious, what state are you in and do you have a chapter in your state? Cheryl, thank you for your comment. Um, we 
won't our goal for this series of webinars is not to give you a, a recipe but to give you the direction for creating your own plan um, we believe that um, advocates in each state will have different priorities they'll have different issues that they want to work on and so our goal by the end of these these four webinars is that you'll have what you need you'll have the resources that you need and the ideas that you need to create a plan that you can where you can achieve some success fairly early on does Washington State have a cha TASH chapter, Jamie? No, not currently, but we have a lot of TASH members in Washington. So um, now would be a good time to begin working on a chapter there. Donald is the um, person on our staff who supports chapter development. And if you give uh, Donald your email address, he can send you he can send you some information to get you started. You would have received the notice for this webinar from me so if you just reply to that email I can talk to you about what it takes to get a chapter formed in your state and since we do have our annual conference coming up there and we already have a conference committee in Washington a Washington Oregon joint conference committee that might make a nice nucleus for a chapter so Susan, you ask, is there a plan to connect state chapters who want to take on the same issue? I'd love to do that. I think, for example, um, if states were really interested in the HCBS waiver implementation and how to leverage that, that would be a great working group that we could put together and, and um, just sort of learn from each other. If states were really interested in increasing inclusive education in their state, that would be another great working group. I think we have a lot of those possibilities. Um, let's see. Um, Victoria, um, I take it you're from California. Shirley Rodriguez was on the call earlier. Yeah, Shirley is still on. You will want to connect with Shirley. She's with the Bay She's with Caltash on the Caltash board and um, works in the Bay Area. Shirley, I know you've been pretty active on the HHS budget issue through your contacts, so you guys are going to want to get connected. Cheryl, I used to belong to TASH, but the focus seemed to be on education. I have a son who is 31 and looking for support as I work on committees working on the HCBS final transition plan. Pennsylvania feels a bit stagnant. I don't know if you mean Pennsylvania TASH or if you mean Pennsylvania as a state. Um, I would suggest that you start by um, drafting an email to Ellen Tierney, who is the co-president of Pennsylvania TASH, and ask her if she could get an email out to the Pennsylvania TASH listserv so that you could work with a few people who are interested in the HCBS final rule. That would be one way to get started in your state. Lisa, do you have other suggestions? <clears throat> well, I guess I want to say that the history of TASH, or the impression can be that it's focused on education and youth, but um, the, certainly the board and a lot of the issues we take on are now very much focused on adults and and what is not working about the system so and I find with Tash in my state Wisconsin that um, we can align ourselves with other advocacy uh, coalitions advocacy groups and um, create a stronger voice for that so um, I would believe that um, Tash in Pennsylvania does have members who are who would be interested and focused on HCBS and adult issues um, and it could be that as Barb said you can network and find out who's interested and and work with them on behalf of Pennsylvania Tash so you've got to do what what you know really you're passionate about um, there's a lot to be done <laughs> there's a lot of need out there but your energy and your commitment is going to come through the best and your ability to stay the course over the long haul if you choose something 
that um, you are most passionate about. And I think with Tash, um, certainly my experience has been that there's passion, there's members who are passionate about uh, the, all of the issues. Um, not everybody shares, you know, everybody comes from different perspectives, but you got, if you can find the Tash members that, that have the same interests, they, they have the same values and it's really easy to work together because you have that values framework. Cheryl, another, and this is really for everyone on the call. Um, one thing that we are attempting to, um, that we're encouraging chapters to do is to establish a policy committee and um, to name a policy chair. Um, if you, if you um, implement that structure, then you are more likely to be on lists within your state. Um, there's a way for the TASH office, there's a more direct way for the TASH office to support your chapter by knowing who to connect with when there's policy, policy issues that are coming up. That policy chair can be listed on your um, chapter um, web page so that there's someone who other people can contact if they want to get active on certain issues. And that policy chair would sort of help frame the, um, with the committee, would help frame the change that you want to create in your state and de help develop the strategy and work the strategy. So um, if, you're, if any of you are interested in that role, I would strongly urge you to talk to your chapter leader and to identify yourself so we can get you started. Um, and support your work. So Susan asks um, how Rhode Island and Oregon successfully closed sheltered workshops. Lisa, do you want to um, provide the update on that? Sure. Um, they are in the process of moving in that direction. I would say or Rhode Island has embraced the challenge. Uh, Oregon is still fighting um, the Department of Justice, but meanwhile is doing an awful lot of things that look like they intend to move in this direction. It seems that they are just a little insulted about having been um, <laughs> the subject of a lawsuit, but you know, if you're, if you're doing the practices, then you have to own up to that. So I would suggest, uh, I think it's olmstead.gov, uh, or if you Google Olmstead, uh, the U.S. Department of Justice maintains a site uh, with all of its um, litigation, and you can find both Oregon's case and Rhode Island's case. And uh, especially in Rhode Island, you can see the settlement agreement that maps out everything that state has committed to doing. Uh, in the next 10 years to um, ensure that uh, everyone in a workshop can transition to integrated community employment and um, integrated supports at, for the times that they are not at work. So they've committed to 40 hours a week of daytime support um, uh, regardless and They've also committed to all youth um, going directly to integrated community services. So um, if you're looking for states who've already done it, it would be Vermont, Maine. Those are the two that I think about um, that have uh, quite a while ago decided they would no longer fund sheltered workshops and um, went through a process of eliminating them as options. I think you're going to see other states take this on. They don't want the U.S. Department of Justice in their state, um, and some states are making very significant plans uh, around employment first and um, closing or eliminating facility-based services. So um, there's a lot to be learned, and I do think with advocacy, the one important thing is that um, when you talk to legislators or you talk to state agency people, they are always going to ask you, how do we do this? How do we do this? Um, and what are the strategies that would work? And you got to be prepared to answer those questions. <laughs> They're going to say, pretend you're me. Sit in my shoes. 
um, uh, and and help me figure out strategically and politically how I how we can get this done and advance this. And so I think that's really important. Not just convincing them there's a problem that needs fixing, but oftentimes they're going to say, "You're going to have to tell me uh, how we would go about fixing this." So, Susan, I'm intrigued by your comment that you'd love to get together with these states. Is there a thought in your mind that you may want to find out what they did at the state level so you can bring it to Arizona? <laughs> there you go. So, I would, um, Vermont does a, um, a workshop every year. I think for a few years running now, they've done a sheltered work conversion event. Um, and it's been national. It's a event open nationally. So they've um, they started by just having a day where they told their own story. But now, as I understand it, um, people come from all over the country, and they have a number of states presenting on strategies they have used. A lot of TASH members, I think, present um, who run agencies who've made these kinds of shifts. Um, so you could uh, also Google the Vermont sheltered workshop conversion um, uh, and you would probably find materials from their prior conferences and I expect they'll host one again this year and Vermont is not a bad place to visit. <laughs> the TASH conference in Portland, Oregon this December will also have, we expect that there will be content on sheltered workshop conversions um, based on what's going on in the country right now with the HCBS waiver reform and with some of the pressure that DOJ is applying to states. So, and we'll be right in Oregon where one of the major lawsuits is happening right now. So we expect that to be a topic at the conference. Um, any other questions? Well, we hope you join us again on Thursday and um, Donald will be sharing with everyone at the end of this call um, how to locate the archive of this session. And I want to thank Lisa again for participating today. Um, Lisa is a nationally recognized expert in systems change at the state level to make sure that uh, adult services are delivered with the intent that people become employed. So we're really lucky to have her as a TASH member and also as part of our webinar. Thanks everybody for being a part of this today and we look forward to engaging with you on Thursday.